guys, welcome back to another edition of Raw Intuition Inside Scoop. I'm very excited to bring you this conversation that we're about to have here, as there aren't many issues that get me more passionate than that of how we are arrogantly using and putting up with the use of toxic chemicals in our communities and especially around our children whether through needles, pills, spraying them on our parks, playgrounds, our lawns, we are allowing industries to dump toxic chemicals practically anywhere without any consequences or recourse. The blatant cover-ups, lack of media coverage, and out-of-court settlements that take place uh, without hardly any substantial change resulting from it, uh, all of these things have potentially long-lasting consequences not just for us, but for all of wildlife, for our future generations, and really all ecosystems that support life on Earth. So I brought a very special guest who I consider a true hero for dedicating his life to sounding the alarms on this gigantic problem, as well as taking actions to change the system. So he's here to talk about some of these issues and give us a better understanding of what we're facing and how we can work together to fix it. So our guest tonight is Andre Liu. And did I say that right? Is it Liu? It'll do. Actually, technically, it's Loy. It's Loy. the German Loy. EU like Freud or Reuters. Okay. But okay. I get called lots of things. So and, and for most people, you know, because... In English, L E U is Lou. Yeah. You know, I live with it. Okay. okay. Sounds good. All Fine. Right. Don't worry. It's good. Okay. Perfect. Andre Loy, who is a longtime organic farmer in Australia, who currently, with his wife, owns an agroecological organic tropical fruit orchard. So that's, that's going to ring true with a lot of our viewers. We love our fruits. Um, in Daintree, Queensland, uh, that supplies fruit to a range of local and international markets. Andre has over 40 years of experience in all areas of agriculture and is also the former president of International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements, um, which is the world umbrella body for the organic sector, whose goal is a worldwide adoption of ecologically, socially, and economically sound systems based on the principles of organic agriculture and currently is the international director of regeneration international so andre is the perfect person to share his insights and vast range of knowledge on this topic and so andre thank you so much for taking time out of your day to to speak with us it's a pleasure matt it's just uh wonderful to be on your show because this is such an important issue for us to talk about. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so before we get into some of kind of the, the more serious stuff, um, I guess what, what got you interested in this field in general and then kind of how did that, you know, work your, how did you work your way into, you know, organic fruit farming? Okay, thanks. So uh, from a young age, you know, on my mother's side, everybody were, were farmers. And I used to get very sick with the slightest exposure to chemicals. So from a very young age, I, I, I started to grow uh, plants without chemicals, even before I knew about the word organic agriculture. Mm. And then... It's actually uh, 49 years ago, 1971, I came up to where I'm living now. And I always remember that day, I'll never forget it. I, I, I went through this, walked through this path or road, roadway through rainforest, came out of the canopy and into this organic farm that was just alive with tropical flowers, tropical fruits, tropical vegetables. I'd never seen so much color, so much diversity, so many interesting plants and, and particularly fruits and different food crops. 
Yeah, it's like I'd walked into the Garden of Eden, and at that point, I knew exactly what I was going to do with my life. And so, I started. You know, it took me a long time, but doing exactly that, and that's what I've done on the farm. You can see behind you. Yeah. And from day one, I've always done it organically. And I think that the really important thing here is to show that you uh, you don't need these chemicals. I've had a lifetime as a successful commercial farmer, mm. never using one of these toxic chemicals. Yeah, I think that's really important for people to understand is, you know, we're, we're told that we need these chemicals in order to, you know, feed everybody, which we'll get into uh, a little later in the interview. Um, but so, so yeah, I mean, how long have you had your, your uh, fruit orchard? Well, th this one I've had for 30 years <laughs> in, in learning, how can you say in learning how to do it? I, I had two previous properties mm. and I learned the hard way through, uh, my failures, the best way to put it, but eventually the only way to do it, I got it right. And on this farm, you know, I'm very proud of it because my wife and I, we raised our children on this farm. This is a, a true family farm. And I think that's something to be really proud of as a farmer yeah. that not only did we make a living, but really importantly raised a family on this wonderful property. Yeah. That's great. Um, okay. So, um, I guess, you know, so you were using your, your family was using pesticides, um, as a kid. Um, how, how have pesticides back then kind of blown up into what they are today and, and how many are being used today in general? Do you know? We're talking, you know, when I was a kid, this is about the time of Rachel Carson. Mm. In, you know, the 1950s and then six, early 60s. And there were probably a few thousand pesticides. Now we have hundreds of thousands. It's just grown exponentially worse. Do we have that many more pests or? <laughs> well, um, that's the other one, which I think is, is uh, very interesting. People got to realize that the person who invented DDT got the Nobel Prize. Because mm -hmm. in those days, about 8% of crops were lost to uh, pests. And they said inventing this wonderful, safe pesticide now is going to save all that loss and increase food supply, and we will be able to feed the world. So they gave him the Nobel Prize. Now, with pesticides, on average, between 16 to up to 21% of um, crops are lost. So in effect, since the invention of DDT and the widespread use of pesticides, crop losses have increased, not decreased. Mm. Interesting. You don't hear that on the news. No, you don't, because they're trying to say, if we don't use pesticides, we'll starve, but start looking at the data. It's the other way around. Right. Yes. The, you know, the damage now done to, to crops is far worse. And in part is because in a normal ecology, you have predators and you have prey. And we call the predators of our pest beneficials because they benefit us. Mm -hmm. And, when we spray, we kill the good guys and the bad guys, the beneficials and the pests. But what happens is because we've got far more pests than um, beneficials, the pests quickly become resistant to the pesticides. And as a result now, that they're not affected by the pesticides. And guess what? The, their predators now don't exist. So they have a field day. So in other words, what we've done by using pesticides is just disrupted the ecology and created paradise for pests. Is there like a general ballpark number of, of how many, you know, are being sprayed every single year, like here in the U S or. Everywhere? No, sorry. Yeah. Look, 
California is probably the best place in the world for, for data. Mm. And the US on the whole is very good, um, reasonably good, I should say, in terms of the figures we can get out of the uh, USDA and sometimes the EPA. Mm. Uh, Europe is reasonably good as well, but the rest of the world, it, it, it's a blank, it's a zero. We, we have no idea what's being sprayed, how much, how often, because you know, the regulatory systems are, you know, how can you say, non-existent to being, you know, barely there yeah. and corrupt systems. Okay, so um, something that I have heard um, is that pesticides originated as weapons of chemical warfare um, before they were used as pesticides. Is that true? And, and kind of, do you know how that transition took place? Yeah, look, in part, some of them were, some of them weren't. Um, DDT came out by itself, uh, that, that group of chemicals, but a lot of the others, like the organophosphates, were developed as nerve poisons for warfare. For instance, the organophosphate group were, were, were developed by um, German scientists. And then the Nazis, when they took power in Germany, took them over and developed them as a group of, uh, you, know, what, you know, chemical weapons. Although we have no evidence that the Nazis actually used them um, in World War II. I want to say that. But, you know, others have, you know, for instance, VX gas, you know, people like Saddam Hussein, that wonderful gentleman um, in Syria at the moment, and others um, have been using these groups of chemicals for killing people. What happened is after World War II, the American um, Troops got all the Nazi scientists and and a uh, lot 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 of the uh, research and found you know all their work for these nerve gases and they just modified the chemistry slightly and produced out of things like VX gas produced malathion and parathion and you know used them as the first pesticides but that group of chemicals works the same in, in the same way to um, damage the nerves of insects will damage the nerves of people. Actually, another good relative of that is the Novichok, you know, the, the poison that the Russians used in England to uh, kill, um, you know, the, the, the Russian spy who, who, who and uh, unfortunately then um, killed some other English people who found it this, you know, discarded bottle that only needs a few drops of it. But that's all the same chemistry. Okay. And then there's similar versions of that that have come out um, that work on similar systems as nerve poisons. And this is a really important issue on how many of these chemicals damage the nervous system and where this is really important is for children because as they're developing their nervous system, small amounts of these chemicals disrupt the development of the nervous system. And just to get it across this part here, our head, our brain, that's our biggest collection of nerves. And we have very good evidence now showing how many of these chemicals like, like the organophosphates, but also other ones like glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, damage the normal development of nerves. And this is why we're seeing this epidemic of autism, ADHD, and other behavioral problems as well as a whole range of health problems. Can you give us an idea of just kind of like how pesticides are designed? Like how do they work? Okay, there's, there's different types of pesticides and they, they work in different ways. Okay. So a lot of them work by damaging the nervous system and in some cases, like, like the organophosphates, they, they destroy a, uh, essentially an enzyme that's 
cells work to regulate the way our nerve signals go. So when a nerve is, fires, a signal goes to another one, another one's like a chain reaction, you know, from if you hit your finger and you get, you know, that just fires a signal from one nerve to another till it goes to your brain, you go, oh, ouch, that hurt. But after it fires, um, the signal, this uh, enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, but we don't need to get into t such a technical detail, it turns it off. So it's not always firing. But that what the organophosphates do is they damage that enzyme. So it starts firing the whole time. And then the best way to say it, 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 it causes the nerves to go so, become so at, overactive, you know, you end up with heart failure or um, breathing difficulties, headaches, all these other things. And eventually people too much because the nerves won't stop, people die. Mm -hmm. Others do it the other way around. They actually block the nerves from working, particularly in the central nervous system. Now that controls our breathing and, you know, our heart beating, you know, we, we breathe and our heart beats without us having to think about it. If you disrupt that and our heart stops beating, well, we know what, what that means. We're not very healthy, are we? But what, what I'm trying to explain is that that's how they kill. But in small doses, because they are disrupting uh, the way the nervous system works, it actually disrupts the whole health. The, the other issue is this is that when they, they test for these, what they call specific disruptions, but these chemicals aren't that specific. They, the best way to say is that they are molecules that are highly reactive against proteins. And when they react, they actually damage the protein. And all our tissues, our nerves, our, you know, you know lungs, our hands, ears, eyes, all, you know, every part of us, kidneys, livers, yeah. are made of proteins. And so what we're finding is small amounts are doing damage. Now, some of our, our, our tissues don't regenerate properly, like kidneys. As we start getting small amounts over time, you get kidney damage. Lungs, eyes are another one. And a lot of them will bond to what's called the myelin. It's the sheath. The best way to say, if you imagine the nerves are like an electrical wire and you have insulation around the outside, now, if you take off insulation of wires, what happens? You know, you get a short, things burn out. It's not very good, you burn down the house. Well, a lot of these chemicals do exactly that to the nerves. The insulation is called myelin and it reacts with it and opens it up. Now, some cases nerves regenerate, but we know our optic nerve doesn't, our hearing, and really importantly, the spinal cord, you know, we know that when, when some of these nerves, when, once they get damaged, there's very little chance of regeneration. And so what we're seeing with these chemicals is, is extensive damage in, in different tissues. And over time, you, 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 it builds up. So actually a very good study came out last week showing how um, most farmers who use pesticides have chronic hearing losses. Mm. And that is because of the way that the, over time, the pesticides have damaged it. You'll actually see also, um, and, and the work should be done, you'll, you'll, you'll find it'll be the same with their eyesight as well. But really importantly, if I want to get back to, you know, the, the critical area is the, you know, the bulk of the, our nerves are in the brain. This is where we're seeing um, a whole range of diseases and things like Parkinson's disease, for example, is, is, a, is a classic one yeah. that we see in, in people who have been exposed to pesticides over time. Because the, you know, the wiring in the brain has been dissolved. With that being said, are these chemicals and pesticides, are they rigorously tested before they're approved for commercial use? Um, and, and how does kind of the testing process and you know, all that, how does that work? 
Well, the, I'll use one word now for it. It's a scam. The more I've learnt about it, the more I've just been absolutely shocked in how they've used this pseudoscience and sold it as, oh, you know, they're all scientifically tested. So let's look at a, an average pesticide that farmers use. It's actually made of multiple ingredients. One they'll call the active ingredient, for instance, the organophosphate. Or you know, I'll give the example, um, actually a really good one, um, is, is Roundup. Mm -hmm. Glyphosate is the active ingredient. Now, if you get pure glyphosate and spray it on a plant, it'll hardly kill it. So to make it work, you have to add these other chemical solvents, adjuvants. An adjuvant is something that makes a product work stronger. And you put this mixture together and now you spray out Roundup and it, it kills nearly everything. But all the testing done is on the glyphosate, not on the Roundup. Mm. And, so, and that's how it's approved. So, and that's the same with all the pesticides. The chemical company just has to nominate one ingredient, call that the active ingredient. In many cases, that's just 1% or 2% mm. of the mixture. And all the other ones, say the solvents, for instance, the petrochemicals, nearly every one of them is shown to be a carcinogen. The adjuvants, a lot of them uh, can be even more toxic than the active ingredient. But the thing is about the adjuvant, like I said before, it's designed to make the active ingredient work stronger. Now, if you make a poison more poisonous, work stronger, you're making it more poisonous. I just want to say that again. If you're making a poison work better, you're making it more poisonous. Yet, the authorities make the assumption that there is no difference in toxicity between this one to two percent that they ingredient that they test and what a farmer uses. Now, in the United States, there's about um, uh, just under 2,000 what they call registered products. And they are mixtures. This is what the farmers use. And not one, and I'll say it again, not one has been tested for any of the long-term diseases that are common in American society. So not one has been tested for cancer, for heart damage, liver problems, birth defects. You know, I can go on and on and on and on. You know, you see all the health problems in society. And I'm not going to say pesticides are the only cause of them. There, there are multiple, but they are a significant contribution. And the chemicals that are being sprayed on food have not been tested for the suite of chronic diseases that affect all of our societies around the world. So what do they say that they test for when they say that they've done safety testing? Some of these chemicals, they test for short-term toxicity. It's called an LD50. Okay. And that's the amount that will kill you in two weeks after exposure. So, you know, so that's what, what I'm talking about now is the, the whole formulation. And this is what they, they use all the time saying, oh, look, you have to have a truckload of, of, of this to get, you know, to, for it to affect you. And, 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 and they're right. You probably do need a truckload for you to die of it in two weeks. Yeah. However, that, you know, it takes more than two weeks to get cancer. It takes more than two weeks to get Parkinson's disease. It takes more than two weeks to get heart disease or lung diseases, you know, and so on and so on and so on. You know, uh, I mean, you start talking about all the hormonal problems that people have, like endometriosis and, and uh, you know, 
reproductive issues. We talk about all these things. You know, they take more than two weeks. So in other words, this, the regulatory authorities have zero evidence that, that these chemicals are safe and do not cause these diseases. Unless you test for it, you have no evidence. And so the word I keep on using, the, these are data-free assumptions. It's not science. Mm. They're just making an assumption up. Science, you, if you want to do, have science, you have evidence. You test and you get evidence and then you make a conclusion based on sound evidence. There is zero for any one of the, the pesticides being sprayed by farmers on our food. Zero. Hmm. So how can you say it's science? Right. So, so speaking of, you know, how they talk about you need a truckload in order for, you know, negative consequences. Um, can you talk about uh, what a non-monotonic dose response is and why that's important? Yeah, look, this is a really important one again because you hear it all the time. Look, the levels are so small, you know, it's not going to affect you. Yeah. And, you know, it's safe. Yes, you know, we can test the food and we'll find multiple pesticides, but don't worry, trust us. We're, you know, we're the, we're, we're, we're the government, we're looking after you and these levels are so small that no harm will come. What has been shown now is that hundreds of chemicals, we know of at least 600 now, that when they start to get down to really small levels, and to give an idea, just to speak about how small, the, when they start getting down to parts per billion and parts per trillion, um, and a part per trillion is if I get an eyedropper and I have one drop on it and I put it in a body of water, which is the size of six Olympic swimming pools of water and add that one drop to it, that's a part per trillion. And yeah, so I want to get across, you know, when I talk about how small is small and we know there's hundreds of chemicals that are active at that level and start disrupting our hormone systems. What happens is when they get down to these low levels, they start acting like hormones. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, how can it do that? You know, how come it doesn't act like a hormone when it's at a big level and now when it's at this microscopic level, it's suddenly dangerous, it doesn't make sense. To explain that is that on our cells, we have these, what are called hormone receptors. And they're a bit like a um, lock and key system. And the cell uses it when it receives the hormone, it, it, um, it's like a message and it starts functioning as per the hormone. And, and, and you know, this is actually very important when children are developing because at certain stages of their development, small signals of these hormones and they are in parts per trillion tell the fetus the developing embryo now it's the time to make your fingers now's the time to make your eyes now's the time to make your reproductive system and so on and th these small amounts go and to the receptor tell it um start doing this and then the body you know the fetus will start normally developing at the specific times mm. what 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 is really interesting here um, these are a bit like a lock and key system so just imagine if you know if we're trying to open a door and i have some steel and i have a um a steel bar that's bigger than the lock and i try to fit it in to open the lock will i open the lock no because it can't fit in but if I get that steel bar and take it to a locksmith and get them to uh, turn it into the right shape key and put it in, I can open the door. Or I can get a locksmith to actually just 
turn that bar into a whole lot of fine, thin wires. And I can stick that in, even though it's not the key, and pick the lock. Mm. And, you know, or I could just leave that wire in it, a little bit of it in it, and then when the person comes with the key, they can't open the lock. And, and what I want to explain here is this is the way these chemicals work. If you can imagine, it's a lock and key system. So when the right chemical goes in, it opens the lock and gives the instructions, say, look, this is the time now to build our reproduct, you know, to build the reproductive system in an embryo. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone comes um, at a different time and with, with, with a lock pick and puts it in and, and opens up, it sends the wrong signal at the wrong time. This is what we call endocrine disruption. Or if a little bit of that, someone leaves a little bit of a wire in it and, and then when, when the, the, the key is supposed to open it at the right time, it can't open it, the embryo misses that opportunity to develop properly. And these are actually known as programming events. If these events don't happen at the right time, at the right amount, children do not develop properly. And so what we're seeing is a whole range of um, problems in terms of mental development, in terms of physical development, and also reproductive system development um, in, in, in children as a result of these chemicals. And I want to say there are hundreds of them, over 600. What I want to say too, there are thousands, not one or two, not 20 or 30, thousands of peer reviewed scientific studies showing this. Good science. And peer reviewed is the gold standard of science. When you know, they're published in a reputable journal yep. and the scientists actually show their, what's called their, their, how they did it, material and methods so other scientists can look at it. This is science, like I said, the gold standard and it's being ignored. Wow, so, so what you're saying is that how they tell us that it, it gets down to being so small that it doesn't really matter. So when a pesticide breaks down or biodegrades, um, you're saying that they are not becoming neutral and disappear like we're told. So, um, I mean, how long are they staying in the environment and how long are they able to have these, these effects? Yeah, I suppose that's the other thing they're trying to say is the new pesticides aren't like the bad ones like DDT that, you know, or we can see now the, the, the forever chemicals, you know. Yeah. By the way, those forever chemicals are endocrine disruptors as well. <laughs> we, you know, um, the PFAS and all, all those that are around, they, they, the smallest amount do damage. But uh, what, what we hear all the time, oh, the new chemicals, aren't like the bad old days, they, they rapidly break down. Yeah. What they don't explain is, yes, they, they do break down, but they don't break down, disappear. They actually form what are called metabolites. And these metabolites are a lot more stable. So an example, I, I've been talking about the organophosphate group of chemicals, the ones that were developed by the Nazis as nerve poisons. Now, when they break down, they form oxins. In other words, they oxidize. And these oxins, you know, can be 40, 50, 100 times more toxic. So yes, they do break down, but now they are seriously more damaging. In fact, the older uh, they are, the worse they are. And they're actually more stable. The best way to say it is, um, our car, <laughs> when, um, you know, they, the steel in our car starts to rust, it oxidizes, you know, as, 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 as we know, rust never sleeps, but, you know, rust is far more persistent than steel and rust will just stay as rust for, you know, however long. 
And it's the same with these chemicals. When they oxidize, think it's like steel rusting. Hmm. They are now far more persistent in the environment and far more toxic and dangerous. Wow. All right, so I've got a couple uh, statements here that I took off of the US EPA's website, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, who is in charge of kind of regulating these things. So I just have a few, you know, inconsistencies with, from what it sounds like. So let me just get your thoughts on these two statements. Um, so under their chemicals and toxics page, it states that the EPA uses sound science to develop ways to help produce safer chemicals and regulate harmful substances and under their basic information about pesticide ingredients, they state all inert ingredients must be approved by the EPA before they can be included in a pesticide. We review safety information about each inert ingredient before approval. If the pesticide will be applied to food or animal feed, a food tolerance is required for each inert ingredient in the product. So do you have any concerns about those statements, about how they're, ac if they're accurate or not? Yeah, of course I do. <laughs> and I'll start with the first one, sound science. Yeah. Now, how is just testing one active ingredient and not testing the mixture yeah. sound science? You know, it's a nonsense. They're just using what are called data-free assumptions. That's not sound science. Right. So let's talk about the spin, and this is spin doctoring, about their inerts that each one must be um, looked at before it's put in. They, you know, in science, we actually ha have a word called the sins of omission. It's what is not said. What is not said is, yes, they might have looked at each of these and said, okay, we, we, we we're happy to have these inerts. What they haven't looked at is when you combine all these inerts with the active ingredient, they have not tested it, the combination. And once again, we have hundreds of papers, of peer-reviewed papers, good, sound science, in fact, the gold standard science, showing that when you add these different toxic chemicals together, you get an additive effect, you know? Duh. If you add more poisons together, you get an additive effect. Yeah. What is more profound is what's called the synergistic effect. An additive effect is one and one makes two. Synergy is where if I add two things together, the effect is greater. You know, so instead of one and one equaling two and equal three, four, five, I've seen some studies where one and one can equal a thousand hmm. in terms of its extra toxicity. And once again, I want to say that, you know, out of all the you know, thousands of products out there, not one has these has been tested for the common diseases that we have in our society. So there is zero sound science, zero science to show they're safe. Hmm. On the other hand, there's hundreds of papers to show they're not safe. And further, I just want to say too, is that, you know, most testing shows multiple pesticides because the EPA doesn't just approve one pesticide for a crop. It'll approve, you know, pesticides are a generic word for insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, mitocides. It'll approve, approve several pesticides, several herbicides to kill the weeds, several fungicides to kill, kill the, you know, the fungi, insecticides to kill insects and so on with the expectation that most of them are used during a normal cropping or production cycle. Consequently, the majority of foods have multiple pesticide residues. 
On top of that, we don't just eat one food. We eat a mixture of food with a mixture of pesticides. So as a result, we get cocktails of these chemicals, cocktails. And, you know, for instance, you know, it's very good work looking at the urine and the blood of the average American and virtually all Americans carry a cocktail of these chemicals in their bodies. Uh, and, and for me, the most concerning was work done by the Environmental Working Group showing around 230 different chemicals in the, cord, you know, the placental cord blood of newborns. That to me is, is, is just you know, what, what, what I call the worst form of toxic assault and neglect you can imagine. Yeah, so is, is this just a coincidence that, that these chemicals and products are getting approved through these regulatory agencies? You know, or is it just by chance? Or is there something going on behind the scenes? Yes, look, look, it's well documented what, what's happening with, with most of these regulatory agencies. It's called the revolving door that, you know, various managers in regulatory agencies end up getting very good jobs in pesticide agencies, um, in pesticide companies, and then various managers from pesticide companies get very good jobs in management of the regulatory agencies. On top of that, the, the whole system of approving chemicals is hidden. The, you know, we cannot access any of the studies that are used to approve uh, any pesticide. What happens is that the studies that are used also come from the pesticide companies, the industry studies, and they're hidden. They're not like the open gold standard peer-reviewed studies that are published in uh, scientific journals that we can access and we can look at. If we want to see these pesticide industry studies, we, they are denied. But, but the only time we get them is either sometimes through court cases, like the Monsanto papers that, that came out in, 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 in the, the uh, Roundup trials, or they are leaked. And then when we look at these studies, we find that they are very poor studies. In many cases, when we look, when we, when we look at the data, or we get independent scientists to look at the data, the studies show that they actually show extensive evidence of damage. And this is ignored by the regulatory agencies. The other thing is there's, there's committees that make these decisions that people who are paid by the pesticide companies sit on. And these committees are usually hidden as well. It's very hard for us to find who's on it. And when we do, we find so many people who, who get paid by the industry. So what we're seeing here is industry studies being approved by people who make their living from the industry and it's completely hidden. We cannot find anything out, out of it. To me, that is the perfect recipe for corruption. And it needs to change that, that only the gold standard in science, peer-reviewed studies are done they are fully available and that no one with any financial ties to the pesticide industry sits on any of the committees that approve these toxic poisons. Yeah. Um, if you've, if you've looked into, you know, the, the food industry or anything kind of associated with it, you're, you're pretty familiar with uh, industry funding and how that affects the, the outcomes of the study. So yeah, if they're just using industry-funded studies, it's no wonder that they would approve them. Um, with that being said, so we know that uh, Bayer ended up settling for like $10 billion on their Roundup claims, something like that, for causing cancer. Um, so even though glyphosate has now been classified as a carcinogen, I still see it lining store shelves all over the place. So I'm just wondering if if it's now considered a carcinogen, why have they not removed it from the store shelves? Don't they 
once they find out something is dangerous, they just immediately take it off the market or or how does that work? Yeah, that's a bit like a fairy tale. (laughs) (laughs) And you've raised uh, to me the classic example when the World Health Organization, the International Agency for Research into Cancer, found that that it it causes cancer. And, And I just want to explain, you know, that they show they had very good studies, and these are the gold standard studies, the peer-reviewed studies showing how it causes multiple cancers in animals. Limited data in humans. The one cancer they did find in humans was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and that's why the court cases against Monsanto are, are about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They gave it the second highest classification for cancer, which is 2A. The, the one classification, which is the highest, is when we have a lot of data for it causing cancer in humans. For instance, products, you know, petrochemical products, asbestos, etc. What happened then is that Monsanto, and this has come out in the Monsanto papers, led a big campaign, disinformation campaign to discredit the uh, World Health Organization scientists who, who, and the World Health Organization for making these claims for classifying as a, as, as a carcinogen. And they then worked with people within the US EPA and, and you know, the, um, in Europe, the European Food Safety Authority, who are basically friendly to them. And, and that's come out very clearly in various papers that we have. And what the regulatory agency said, our studies show that it does not cause cancer. But um, getting back to this hidden process, when we say, well, where are these studies? Where are they? Oh, we can't, they're commercial in confidence. We can't show you these studies showing that it does not cause cancer. And what I would argue is that, you know, Bay has just settled for $10 billion for out of court, but they've lost three court cases, Monsanto, Bayer. Now, if you're going to lose billions of dollars in a court case and you had good scientific evidence to prove that you're innocent, that your product does not cause cancer, wouldn't you release it? Wouldn't you get your lawyers to say, Here's the evidence that this product does not cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Mm-hmm. So, where, so what I want to say is they did not show it in the court case. They will not let us see the evidence that's used to say that this does not cause cancer. Why? What are they hiding? What is, what is the process for getting these chemicals? I mean, how do we get them taken off the market? With, with great difficulty. You know, we, I was just talking before about the endocrine disrupting chemicals, the ones that affect the, the normal development yeah. of, uh, of children. And a classic is atrazine. It's been banned in Europe. But for instance, in the United States and here in Australia, it's, it's one of the most common chemicals. There's been really good work, particularly done by uh, Dr. Tyrone Hayes, showing how you know, in parts per trillion, parts per billion, it essentially causes um, male frogs to become females. But we, we actually know that you know, th- these, these systems happen to all animals, including us. And, and it's widespread. In, you know, in the United States, for instance, the United States Geological Survey shows that atrazine is in, in virtually every watercourse. It's in, in the rain, you know, in the Midwest. It's on nearly every bit of food. And so, we're getting, you know, people are getting small amounts of it and it is disrupting the reproductive systems of people as well as causing other things like ovarian cancer. We have very good research showing how it causes ovarian cancer. And, you know, despite all this evidence, despite other countries banning it based on this evidence, it has not been banned in the US or Australia. The regulatory agencies just refuse to do it. You know, back in the 1990s, the, you know, the Congress charged, you know, basically, um, told the you know 
US EPA that they were supposed to start working on all these endocrine disrupting chemicals to get them out of the system, start banning them. You know, Congress told US EPA to do it. There's a law. Mm -hmm. How many, you know, in 30 years, how many of these chemicals have been taken off, been banned anywhere, in fact, anywhere around the world? I shouldn't just blame the US EPA. Ironically, they're one of the better, which is, you know, very sad. <laughs> but, but, you know, zero, not one, anywhere on the world has been banned. So don't hold your breath hoping that the regulatory agencies are going to do the right thing because they, they haven't and they won't. The only way we can do it is for us to be, empower ourselves to make the decisions of how we avoid it. And the best way to do that is buy organic food. So we buy food without these chemicals. Essentially, vote with your wallet. Make the change. You know, the organic industry is worth, worth over $100 billion now, and it's growing. It's the fastest food sector, multi-product agricultural sector in the world. And the more people who buy organic food, the more farmers have to change to meet the markets. And, and the change is considerable. All the main food companies like General Mills and so on now have organic lines because if they don't their market share goes backwards you know fact is we are the biggest food revolution and doing more to get pesticides off the market than any other way just by buying organic so if people say well what can i do about it it's your choice when when you go into a store, a supermarket, or even better still, a farmer's market, only buy organic. And by making sure that the money only goes to organic farmers and not to farmers who spray chemicals, we will change. And it is changing because what's happening in the US and everywhere else, you know, on the whole, um, thousands and thousands of farmers uh, you know, going off their farms because they're not viable. On the other hand, we are growing organic farmers. We're changing farmers. Organic farming is going against the trend. We are getting more and more organic farmers. And what I really love about it too is we're getting the new generation, young people, young women and men now are taking up farming mm -hmm. as an occupation, and particularly organic farming. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, and just... From a personal experience, the one of our grocery stores here um, called Natural Grocers is, you know, they only sell organic produce. There's no conventional produce that they sell. So that's, I mean, just seeing things like that is encouraging and just showing how the demand for organic produce, like you said, it's just, it's really, you know, finally getting the attention that it needs. Yeah. And, and, and what I really want to say here where, where it's really important is for, for moms and pops. You know, I was talking about how the developing embryo, developing fetus is affected by the smallest amounts of these chemicals as they develop. Yeah. Also, we know young children. And actually, the other um, particularly critical time is puberty when, when hormones are changing and small amounts of these artificial hormones also damage those processes as well. So I, I, I would say to all parents out there and particularly people who want to be parents, start eating organic now. You know, we actually know, we have the science that the, these chemicals actually affect sperm development. They can be found in the fallopian chewed, uh, chewed fluid. <laughs> And so what we're seeing is that children are being pre-polluted even before they've been conceived. And then we know they cross the, um, the placental barrier and they're affecting the, the embryo. Really importantly, 
um, with the embryo and children up to about six months old, they don't have the, the blood brain barrier that we have to prevent the, the cross of these toxic chemicals. And any of these chemicals will actually go and get into the brain and affect the development of the brain. The other really important issue is that as adults, our liver can de has enzymes that can detoxify a lot of chemicals. The embryo and young children don't have these enzymes either. So they have, doesn't matter how small the amount is, they have no way of detoxifying them. So what we have to do is make sure that they get zero. And the only way we can do that is through eating organic. And once again, you know, I just want to get back to science. We have lots of scientific papers showing that once we put children on organic food, these chemicals will start disappearing out of their system in days, particularly the organophosphate, the nerve poison group. Mm -hmm. Within four days on an organic diet, that cannot be detected in the urine of children. Now that is just phenomenally good news. Since the mid 1990s, that's back when they started with the sale of GMO foods um, for commercial use. And um, in your book, The Myths About Safe Pesticides, you mention how there's a near parallel rise in certain conditions like autism, thyroid diseases, obesity, Alzheimer's, diabetes, various cancers. Um, you know, what is being done about, about these um, you know, parallels? Just a little bit of background on that. that that's a peer-reviewed paper that I was one of the authors with, with uh, Dr. Nancy Swanson. And the data we got was um, from the USDA in terms of the increase in the amount of glyphosate, you know, or, or Roundup, and the amount of uh, GMO crops. And then we got other data on the increase in diseases from, um, you know, reputable sources such as the CDC, for instance. And we charted the increase and we actually picked just a bit over 20 of them where that increase was so um how can you say so close that we we did what's called a pearson's correlation coefficient and i know it's a big word but it's what you use to see if when 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 you see a correlation between two things where where, where two graphs are going up in the same level you know are they, ha, ha, are they related? You know, is a chance that one causes the other because sometimes they can't be related. For instance, you know, you might be able to get the sale of mobile phones from 1990 and track that uh, with the increase of these diseases as well, or, or the sale of, um, you know, sailboats in Sweden or something and, and, and it tracks. So, so it's just a, how can you say, it's a coincidence. But when, when you start doing it over many years and you start using this uh, tool of st um, this statistical tool, it gives you a, a very good look at the chance that it's a coincidence. Now, in each of these, if they were a coincidence, it would be one chance in 10,000. So it's highly unlikely that glyphosate, the increase in glyphosate, which was being used on GMO crops, was not the cause of these diseases. Now, we got attacked, for instance, when we showed, <clears throat> excuse me, when we showed the increase in cancers with glyphosate. And what came out after we did it was the World Health Organization report showing uh, you know, how glyphosate cause, causes cancer. We also got attacked over the issue of glyphosate and autism because we showed the, the strong co correlation. 
what's come out since now are several studies, one showing how it damages the, the normal growth of nerve cells. Then another one, a very good study now showing the increase in autism in uh, offspring from glyphosate. So since we did this, this research, other research has come out to back up what we did, that these graphs are not coincidences. They clearly show that glyphosate, Roundup, is causing around 20 major diseases in the US. And this increase in glyphosate is due to the increase in uh, you know, Roundup ready GMO corn and soy. So you mentioned, um, you know, it really, it, it matters when the exposure to these pesticides is. Um, you know, we know that there's been glyphosate and other pesticides found in, in baby foods and, and different products like that. They're sprayed on playgrounds, um, you know, schoolyards. So what, what are some things that parents can do um, to protect their children from, from these exposures? Okay, look, this is a really good one and very important. The fact is the majority of people get their exposure from food. And I need to say that again. The majority of people get their exposure to pesticides from food because most people aren't farmers. Sure. Then the second exposure are the environmental ones, like you're saying, the, the, the spraying of roadsides or sidewalks, or particularly, you know, which I, I, I find horrific, the spraying of children's playgrounds. Yeah. And so I, I would argue you know, that, that you need to try and avoid these areas, but very importantly, work with your local governments to ensure they no longer sp spray roadsides or sidewalks and they don't spray children's playgrounds. And there's lots of alternatives. For instance, a lot of councils now are just using steam and steaming it mm. if you would, instead of the children's playground. One of the, the wonderful things that has been done, uh, particularly in, in parts of the US and in the Midwest, is instead of spraying out roadsides, start planting them out with native flowering plants. You know, in the Midwest, you know, the, the wonderful prairie plants that you've got, this incredible diversity. So instead of having these dead brown roadsides, suddenly you've got these, these wonderful, colorful verges, you know, and we can actually use this instead of killing things all the time and, and nuking anything because it's a weed and having dead brown areas and bare soil, go the other way around into living systems and start planting other species to, that we like, that, 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 that can um, take over from what we call a weeds. And essentially make these gardens of Edens rather than these hell holes. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like a, uh, a statement in your book where you, you said that pesticides, it was essentially pesticides don't eliminate pests. They create them. Um, you know, could you, could you just expand on that a little bit just so people really understand that? Okay. Yeah. Everybody thinks so. Oh, Pesticides um, eliminate pests. That's what they're there for. But what happens is, you know, pests and their beneficials are both affected by, by pesticides. And one of the things I, I do want to say too, I just want to get back to the thing of planting these flowering plants. Mm -hmm. Most of the beneficials have part of their life uh, have eating uh, feeding on nectar and pollen so they need flowering plants so if we plant lots of flowers in, in our farming systems in our gardening systems in our um, parklands and road verges we bring in uh, habitat for beneficials but when we spray pesticides we kill the pest and the beneficial the beneficials are the predators of the pests in nature there's always more um, how can you say prey than predator? You know, for instance, there's a lot more, you know, um, deers and and um, 
then there are lions, for instance. You've always got, you know, less predators than prey. When we spray the prey, the pest, because there's so many of them, they can quickly evolve resistance to pesticides. But because there's so few of the predators, they don't evolve so quickly. They disappear quite quickly. And so what we're doing over time is changing the ecosystem so that we now have these pests that are resistant to pesticides and weeds, by the way, that get resistant to herbicides. And they now dominate the ecosystem because they're no longer affected by the spray and they no longer have their predators. That's why we create pests. And that's why the amount of pests has increased and also the amount of pesticide use continues to go up year after year after year. And, and that's the same with weeds as well? They Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, the whole thing of the Roundup Ready was, oh, uh, you know, this is the solution to your weeds. And, you know, because Roundup is a, what they call broad spectrum. Broad spectrum is a nice way to say it kills everything. So the only things that didn't kill are the genetically modified plants that they, 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 they put in a gene from a bacteria that they found was resistant to, um, to Roundup. So these plants are actually part bacteria, which is also very frightening. Mm. The, but that same thing of just continuously using Roundup on, on weeds, eventually one or two will evolve resistance and the more you spray the Roundup, they've got no competition from other plants. So these weeds now have a field day. They, they, they've got no other plants they have to compete with. They just grow. And the more you spray them, the more you knock out the ones that uh, are, are sensitive to Roundup. And the more you select for the ones that don't give a damn about Roundup, you know. And some of these weeds, like Palmer amaranth, I don't know if you've seen the pictures of it in the Midwest now, are just monster weeds. They just mm -hmm. climb over the corn and pull it down. So what's the solution? Oh, we need to get a new chemical. So the, the big one they're trying now is dicamba. And there's been the big court cases about that because it's drifted and it's been killing out all these other crops the ones that aren't genetically modified to be resistant to it. And there's been uh, court cases this year and Bayer and other companies now have been forced to take it off the market, even though the EPA had approved it and said it was totally safe and it wasn't going to cause any drift problems. Of course, the pesticide companies now are challenging the um, court decisions to try and spray out the dicamba. They've got other ones now where they're using 2,4-D, which is half of Agent Orange, and one where they're mixing this, you know, part Agent Orange, part dicamba, and part glyphosate. Three of them together now, you know, to, 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 to nuke weeds, mm. and so on and so on. So it's, you just see what it is, it's just this escalation of toxic poisons. Yeah. And you know, it has to stop. And, and we know, I just want to say again, they are not necessary. There are good organic farmers all through the Midwest, all through the US, who are growing really good crops without these pesticides. And, and one of the things I want to say is we have really good research in the US showing how organic farmers can get the same and even higher yields than these chemically intensive farmers. Yeah, and that's that's important because that flies in the face of everything that we're told about. We have to have these giant monocrops of corn and soy. Uh, we have to put chemicals on them in order to feed the world. Um, otherwise, we're not going to have enough food to grow. Um, but I want to ask you, are we actually feeding the world with these massive monocrops of corn and soy? I know that's what they're saying. We need to feed the world with these monocrops. Uh Actually, there's another paper I wrote showing um, how the, the amount of hungry people in the world was declining 
and uh, over time, and particularly uh, the food insecure. And what we mean by food insecure is that these are people that have uh, several months of the year where there's days where they don't eat, where the children don't eat. And it's pretty sad. And at the moment, we have around 800 million of them. But it went down to about, uh, I think it was about 600 million by 1990. And then it's been steadily climbing up since the mid 1990s. Now, it's in the mid 1990s when you know, GMO corn and soy were, um, you know, were, were started to be grown. So if you look at the data, you can see the amount of food insecure people has increased, not decreased, since the advent of GMO. So that, that alone puts a myth to it. But, you know, the, the real issue here is that, you know, the big problem with this model is that most of this GMO is not grown for, to directly feeding humans. It either feeds cars as ethanol, cars and trucks and tractors, or it goes into big CAFOs where for every 10 pounds of vegetable protein, you produce one pound of animal protein. Very efficient. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Sounds sustainable. Other words, yeah, very sustainable. Yeah, exactly. They're knocking down the Amazon, for instance, to grow all the GMO corn and soy, yeah. putting it in big boats to go to, you know, the, um, what I call the animal concentration camps, yeah. these cruel animal concentration camps in uh, Europe and in China. And, you know, so, so they're incredible ecological damage in Latin America. And then when it gets to the other side, it's also ecological damage in term, and, and, and cruelty, incredible animal cruelty to feed um, these confined animals. And then, you know, the disposal of all the manure, manure lagoons and all the other problems to make what is essentially toxic food yeah. and junk food. It's, it, you know, the whole system is a sham and an environmental disaster and it is not feeding the world because what, what we're seeing on the other side is we actually have more people in the world who are obese than who are, you know, undernourished. You know, it's, yeah. so what we're seeing is a completely unfair, uneven, distribution system the you know the gmos have contributed to our obesity epidemic and our junk food epidemic through a whole range of reasons mm -hmm. i just want to say when i talk about feeding the world the work we did when when, when i was president of, of iphone uh, a very good paper that was put out by um two united nations organizations united nations food and agriculture organization, the United Nations, um, uh, sorry, United, sorry, United Nations Environment Organization, the United Nations Conference for, for, um, for, for Trade, UNTAG. And they looked at over 100 organic projects around Africa. And they found on average where we taught these farmers to go from um, what, what you probably call organic by neglect to, or just, you know, the average smallholder to organic by design and, and, and using good organic practices. We increased food production by over a hundred percent in yields. That's what you do. And, and in those projects, we took these people from being hungry to having food all year round, took them to being, um, you know, being some of the, the most abject poor people on the planet, what I call violent poverty, when people don't get food, they cannot afford clothes and afford education, they have good houses now, they can, they can send their children to school, particularly the daughters who usually miss out, you know, they can socialize and enjoy life. You know. And 
I just want to say that all we need, we don't need to spend tens of millions of dollars developing one GMO. If we had that money, we could, we could feed the world tomorrow because we just need training. We know what to do and we're doing it. And, and already, you know, every year we get hundreds of thousands of new um, organic farmers. If we had this money, we could get more and take these people out of poverty, increase food production. Like I said, in most of the developing world where the majority of the hungry are, we can increase food production by 100% just by teaching good organic practices. So cheap, so easy, and so effective. Yeah, and, and on the other side of the coin, what is what are these genetically modified, you know, pesticide dependent uh, practices doing to farmers around the world? They are putting them further into debt, and I, I think this is the, the the big issue that we're seeing. Um, that they're failing nearly everywhere. I know there's a lot of spin saying how good they are, but the data we have shows in most of the developing world how much they fail. They don't. They're not resilient to the, the type of conditions they have. The GM crops are dependent on large amounts of fertilizers, large amounts of irrigation, which the, most of the farmers in the developing world can't afford, can't do. And so they tend to fail and, 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 and leave these farmers with crop failure. The farmers usually have to borrow the money to, to, to get the seeds whereas before they used to grow it, borrow the money for the, for the fertilizers, which before they didn't need. I believe they, need, they still need pesticides for most of these GM crops. And they borrow all of that. And then when they have crop failure, they go into debt. And what we see around the world now is the loss of millions of farmers because of this debt. And the other issue is farmer suicide because of this debt. It's a massive problem. How many um, farmers have committed suicide? And I know we get the industry saying, oh, yeah, that's not true, blah, blah, blah. I'm someone who goes to every continent every year. I meet with farmers. And, and I can tell you, I've been to meetings with the families, with the wives and the children, you know, of these farms you know, who have lost their, their fathers and their husbands. And, you know, the devastation, the sadness, you know, it, the lives ruined as a result. You know, this is a tragedy, an incredible tragedy. And it, it's something we need to turn around. And I can tell you in the same areas, you know, growing the same crops, you know, such as cotton, instead of the BT, the Roundup, you know, the, the, the um, pesticide um, resistant GMO, um, which I should call pesticide making GMO cotton. The organic cotton growers are doing very well. There has not been one suicide of one organic grower. There hasn't been one organic grower has had to walk off their farm with nothing in debt. It's the other way around. We get more and more organic farmers every year. We are the, truly the good news story. What about for the environment? What are like what are some of the long term consequences? Um, you know, we're going to see from using these practices. Okay, I can give you a very good one. It's called the the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> it's getting bigger every year. Yeah. There's another one in Europe, in, in the Bay of Biscay. Other ones in the Mediterranean. I I live opposite the the greatest coral reef system in the world, the Great Barrier Reef. And I can tell you the same thing's happening here. Hmm. The, the reefs are dying in part because of climate change, but a very good report came out last month showing multiple, the effect of multiple pesticides out on the reef. But we also know the fertilizers are causing algal growth to grow. The beach uh, just uh, a mile away from my place in the 1970s when I used to go there you, you know you, you'd walk from the sand out into these low coral gardens beautiful coral gardens if I walk out there now it's just mud and and dead 
slimy rock. Mm. All those beautiful coral gardens are dead. And that is due to soil loss, pesticides, and fertilizers going out and killing the coral. That's the, the, what we call the fringing reefs, but now it's starting to happen on the outer reef. Yeah, and a lot of species depend on those reefs to live. You know, it's their, that's their environment that they require. And... Yeah, and, and a good example of a species that is critically endangered because of, 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 of pesticides, of GMO, uh, monarch butterfly, the most famous insect migration on the planet from Mexico up to Canada and back. Yeah. And it's collapsing so rapidly. And we know because its favorite food, the milkweed, is being killed right. by Roundup and, 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 and by, by spraying. Mm -hmm. you know, it, this, this is a massive tragedy that needs to stop. Yeah. Um, so, oh, I was going to ask you just one other question about uh, these GMO fields. Um, say there's somebody living near a GMO field. Um, I actually live very close to a bunch of GMO fields of corn and soy. Um, you know, what are, what are the risks people are at for pesticide drift or, you know, contaminated water, things like that? Are there any studies or anything showing people's health effects from living near these areas? Yeah, there's very good studies. And the closer you live to uh, um, farms that are sprayed, the higher the risk. So, for instance, in the Midwest, nearly all the uh, groundwater is contaminated with, with uh, multiple pesticides yeah. and with um, the nitrates from fertilizers. And there was a very good study done by um, Warren Porter and colleagues in your neighboring state in Wisconsin based on the chemicals that are commonly found in the groundwater that people drink in the Midwest. And that showed a whole range of developmental problems and other problems, particularly the thyroid uh, a, 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 as a result of, um, of exposure to these. Then we, we know, you know, that there's a whole range of other types of diseases you'll see so, for instance, things like, like Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. then all the cancers, and particularly cancers of the sexual tissues that are really evident in farming society. So when you talk about breast cancer, um, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, and also endometriosis, and then in um, men, of course, prostate and testicular cancer, uh, are very strongly linked. Then there's a whole range of birth defects, particularly in boys in the whole um, you know, the urinal um, genital tract. There's the, the issue of um, fall, falling sperm counts and the difficulty of conceiving. There's the issue of uh, miscarriages and so on and so on that you know, I, we can list the amount of diseases and health problems that come from spray drift from neighboring farms. And we know that many of these sprays will go, you know, not, 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 not just for yards, not just for miles, but sometimes for hundreds of miles. Wow. So some of them like, like dicamba, for instance, uh, what happens is, Best way I say it evaporates. And when things evaporate, they form a cloud. They don't just evaporate and disperse. If you have a look at when, you know, you see how clouds form and then clouds travel. And then when, um, you know, they, that's the best way I say during the day, they rise up, they form, they travel. And then when nighttime time, evening comes, what happens? They settle. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you get a whole cloud or pesticides suddenly traveling. And, and sometimes it can be 50, 60 miles, 80 miles that they travel. So someone might have sprayed 20 miles away and suddenly you, you, you get it on your place. 
Mm. There's no safe distance from pesticide drift. Wow. Well, that's scary. <laughs> I'm starting to rethink the fog that I see in the morning when I'm driving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, I guess one, one other question before we get to some solutions um, is uh, regarding here in the U.S. we have the USDA organic certification. Uh, is, is this a trustworthy system? Can we, can we be confident that our, um, you know, our food is actually free of these toxic pesticides or are they just testing for certain pesticides and not you know, catching some other ones? Okay. Look, I know there's a lot, of, lot said about the USDA system. Um, I just want to say that when I was the international president of the organic system, I looked at all of the national systems. Now, of course, the USDA system is not perfect, and I don't know of any that are perfect. But I, I, I will say very clearly, it is one of the better ones on the planet. Yes, and hopefully... Over time, it can be, be made better. Yeah. But just because it's not perfect doesn't mean it is not good. It is good. And trust it. It's, you know, on the whole, you know, the, you, you can be assured. If you want to avoid pesticides, look for the USDA label. Seriously, it's okay. good. That's good to know. Good to know. All right, so let's get to some solutions here. I think we've, we've probably scared some people for quite a while here. So maybe let's give them some hope and just let them, you know, give them some steps they can take to, um, you know, protect themselves, to improve their communities and, and anything else. Well, I'll just get down to you know, the simplest thing you can do is buy organic food. And, you know, the easiest way is to look for the USDA logo. logo. You know, you, you can trust it. But there are other ways as well. And, you know, for instance, go to your local farmer's market. Get to know the farmers. Uh, many of the farmers will be certified with the USDA. There's a, a few other um, schemes. But... You know, what I mean is do your homework, have a look and don't just trust, just check out if it's not USDA. And the, the other one for me are things like CSAs are really good, you know, and they get, you know, join a CSA, go out, see what they're doing, see with your own eyes. That's the best certification system on the planet as far as I'm concerned. Walk out on the farm, meet the farmer, see how it's growing, and you'll know if they're genuine. And, uh, and for me too, there's, 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 you know, fresh food, fresh off the farm is as good as it gets local. And, you know, and one th wonderful thing about CSAs is that, you can actually be involved in the production of your food, even if you're not a farmer. And, and, and that's a lovely thing. But I also love farmer's markets. I just love going out there and just seeing the fresh food come in and diversity, you know, when spring and summer and autumn comes and, and all the different seasonal, you know, fruits and veggies that you can get different crops other products that people have made and that that's another wonderful way to do it and i suppose the other one for me is the whole issue of rediscovering food and the joy of it the joy of cooking getting back to having a food culture rather than buying highly processed junk toxic junk out of supermarkets and the thing is, people say, oh, look, organic food is so expensive. When you start going away from buying processed junk food and start buying fresh fruit, vegetables, meats, milk, dairy products, and so on, it actually turns out to be cheaper, much cheaper and healthier. 
and really far more enjoyable you know, when you just discover that joy of cooking food that for the first time has real flavor. You don't have to add in all these special sauces and things, you know, what I find actually these days we're pretty well locked down here and I, I, I'm living off a lot of what I grow and I can't tell you how much I enjoy doing that. And, and most of that, you know, maybe a little bit of salt on it. That's it, you know, because you get back to real flavor. And, and I think this is what I want to inspire you about is this new food culture and how exciting and enjoyable it is. And on top of that, we know that it is so much healthier. The, we have lots of studies on the difference in the health benefits and nutrition between organic and non-organic food. And you get these people saying there's no difference. Actually, there's a huge difference. And the, the best meta studies that have compared, you know, a meta study is where you get a lot of studies and you put them together to make a comparison. That's the best way to look at it. And one of the best is looked at over 230 different comparison studies between organic and non-organic and they clearly showed how organic is far more nutritious and especially in the antioxidants and we're now starting to understand how important antioxidants are in preventing our modern diseases like cancer heart disease liver disease you know type 2 diabetes you know so on and so on the but we also know that they can help in the treatment of these diseases as well as the prevention. And on average, organic foods contain around 30% more. And the other one I just want to say to people say there's no evidence that organic food tastes better. Actually, many of these antioxidants are called flavonoids. And the word flavonoid comes from is because that's where we get our flavor from. So if you have 30% more flavonoids, you have 30% more flavor. That is scientifically provable. So I want to get, get that across. So not only is it healthier, it, it does taste better. So on, on the level of, of nutrients, it's healthier. And then most importantly is the avoidance of pesticides and particularly for children, for the developing embryo, the fetus, young children. But the other time we actually now know that avoiding pesticides and, and we need these antioxidants is as we age, we start getting into our middle age and onwards. It is really important to make sure that we can actually enjoy the our older years and avoid all the chronic diseases that, that tend to affect people as they age. Yeah. You mentioned the car earlier and how it rusts, you know, mm. the antioxidants are basically preventing the equivalent of, you know, a car rusting, our bodies rusting from the inside. They, they prevent that oxidation. So yeah. that, yeah, that's no, that, exactly. That, that's the best analogy. What happens is that, uh, as we age, but also as we eat, and particularly with um, a lot of the things we eat or in junk food, they make what are called reactive oxy oxygen species. That's right. the word. But the best way to say is that they rust the different, uh, you know, cells, proteins, yep. DNA, all the different parts of our body, turn it into rust and damage it. So an antioxidant stops them from doing it. It actually um, binds with these uh, reactive oxygen species and neutralizes them and stops them from rusting our bodies. That's the, yeah, it's a really good analogy you used. I love it. I'll yeah. steal it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> you know, another analogy and not to get away from our solutions here, but the other analogy that I, I kind of thought of when I was looking into, you know, your book and, and coming up with questions for you, it, am I correct in saying, so when a pesticide breaks down, it, it essentially 
So if I were to take a ceramic plate and smash it on the ground, I would have a bunch of little pieces of ceramic plate. But when we're talking about pesticides, it would be like if I took that ceramic plate, I smash it on the ground, I would have knives and forks and cups. Like it, it changes into something completely different and, and more toxic. Uh, uh, yeah, look, look, actually, probably a better way to say it is this. Um, if, I, if you've got a, a glass and, you know, you have, you know, and you have that on the ground and you just, you know, touch it with your bare feet, it, it won't do much. Mm -hmm. But if I get that glass and smash it on the ground and it's all broken shards of glass and start walking on it, I'll yep. cut my feet to bits. I like that. And that's, that's a better analogy to explain what is happening when they break down. Sure. They become more reactive mm -hmm. you know, in chemical word. And the best analogy to say is if something is more reactive, it, it, it cuts things up more. <laughs> and so it gets into your body and cuts up all the different uh, cells. You know, they actually react with proteins and, uh, or amino acids. And, you know, every one of our cells has amino acids. Our DNA is amino acids. Our, our hormones are amino acids and so on and so on. So they're all through our body. And, you know, this is how they can just wreak incredible damage throughout the body. And, and the fact is because we have thousands of cell types, thousands of different types of amino acids and combinations, you know, the science is at its infancy in terms of understanding the damage they do. The, the reality is uh, we probably understand less than a fraction of a percent of the damage that, that one of these chemicals can do to our bodies. Mm -hmm. Put it into perspective. Yeah. How little science we have. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it's, it's scary and it's, uh, just, it, it can make, if you really think about it, it should just make you so angry because they're, they're just willy nilly spraying these things all over, you know, and it's, they're ubiquitous everywhere you go. So, yeah. Yeah. It does make me angry and that's why I've written the books and that's why I put so much time in, in being in organizations to fight it. Yeah. And part, we have to make people aware of how dangerous these are and get rid of the mythology that, oh yeah, the chemicals are there, but they're scientifically tested, they're safe, and the levels are so small, you don't need to worry about it. Yeah. And we have to get rid of the other mythology that, oh, if we don't use them, we're going to starve. These are mythologies. Yeah. The evidence is the other way around. The evidence is that we, you know, we have no data on s that they're safe, no evidence that one of the chemicals that are used on our food or, you know, the actual products they use on our food are safe as used because mm -hmm. it has not been tested. There are no studies to show that they prevent, they, they do not cause the diseases that we've got. So that's not evidence of safety. And the, 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 the other really important issue here is to get the fact that we do not need them. We have really good scientific evidence that we can have agricultural systems, every crop, we can get the same and if not better yields without using them. They are not needed. Yeah. And that, that are two things we need to get across. And the third one for me is how do we get this change? Well, don't wait for government to do it for you. Do it yourself and use your wallet. Vote with your wallet mm -hmm. and only buy organic. That will make the change. It's dollars that change things. Yeah. And you can empower yourself by always buying organic, always eating organic. And that's how also you can avoid these poisons. So that's the win-win. Just buy and eat organic food and we will change the world. Perfect. 
Yeah, and another action step I would I would encourage people to take is to pick up a copy of Andre's book, The Myths of Safe Pesticides. Um, and you've actually had a more recent book come out. Um, is it Poisoning Our Children? Yeah. Poisoning Our Children. Yeah, it's uh, an expansion of that book. Some okay. of the information is the same. I, I use the same format. But I wrote this one for moms and pops. The, the, I wrote Poisoning Our Children for moms and pops so they can understand the damage that the pesticides in food do to children, to the developing fetus and young children and teenagers. Because for me, this is the biggest crime. It's, it, 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 it's a crime. Yeah. It's child abuse at the worst scale being done. Yep. And parents don't realize this. And I, I want them to be aware so that they can make the right decisions. Because you know, what kind of society poisons its children? It's madness. You know, poisons our future. Our children are our future. And as parents, you know, probably the most important thing we do is raise children and give them the best future. And unfortunately, that's not happening. We're seeing all these problems and they can be avoided so simply just by buying and eating organic food and avoiding these poisons around the house, in the playgrounds and so on. It's simple, so simple to end up having a great future. Yeah, very well said. All right. So uh, is there any place that people can go to follow you or look into, you know, the work you're doing and support you? At the moment, it's with Regeneration International, and that's just www.regenerationinternational, as one word, .org. And there you'll see what we're doing. We're very active on that site, and we have a lot of really good information. Terrific. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll put a link in the description box below this video. And yeah, I mean, just, I cannot thank you enough for taking, you know, so much time out of your day to, to share this with, with our viewers and, um, you know, just being so generous with, with all this is, it's really appreciated. So thank you so much. Works both ways. I want to thank you very much for, uh, inviting me on your show so I can talk about and get the information out. So Matt, thank you too. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I will say, you know, <laughs> if I was going to pick anywhere in the world to be in, in a lockdown, it, it would be where you're at. <laughs> I think you've probably got the perfect situation there on a fruit farm. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not too tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, hopefully it's over sooner than, than later and, but enjoy your time, you know, there and, and best wishes with, you know, moving forward, this movement and, and everything you're doing. Yeah. When it's over, I look forward to return, returning back to Minnesota. I, yeah. I really, really like Minnesota. Yeah. It's a great place. Let me know if you're coming back. I'll, you know, you get, you got a place, you got a place here. I'm sure you got plenty of friends around here. Though. Yeah. Don't worry. I know Minnesota well. It's, right. it's, it's one, one of my favorite states. Right. All right, Andre. Well, thank you again. And I hope to, you know, connect again soon in the future. Yeah, you too, Matt. Ciao. Right. Detoxify your mind and body. Be the change you want to see. Small steps towards living better. Small steps to where I want to be.